Hello, everyone. So I'm Damien. Um, I got my PhD here working with Marcelo. And the next three lectures that I'm going to be giving are basically a synopsis of my thesis work. <clears throat> so my, my work has been on using information measures uh, and applying them to physical systems. And you know, the, the word information to me is pretty confusing because what is it? It seems like a very subjective quantity. And when I started applying informational measures to physical systems, um, I really had to grapple with what information means and how it is related to the subjective experience. Um, so these talks are going to be sort of how I came to terms with understanding the word information and how I then became very comfortable with using information measures in physical systems. Because what ends up happening when you do that is you end up creating an informational narrative to describe systems, which is very, very different than the physical narrative that we're used to in science. A physical narrative usually grounds us in some sort of ontology where we talk about you know, atoms striking each other, interacting, the, uh, uh, can we close the door? <clears throat> Different particles interacting with one another, um, you know, bouncing off of one another with this kinetic energy and that momentum. And this is a very physical narrative. You can talk about biological systems from the viewpoint of this physical narrative. You could talk about where the different atoms are in DNA, how they are connected to one another, what happens physically during uh, the process of cell replication. But that physical narrative seems very, very limited. There's a far richer narrative that we can use to describe what happens in biological systems, uh, how information is stored in the DNA molecules, how it ends up being transferred to uh, RNA, uh, translated into proteins. Uh, I think that that narrative gives us a much better perspective on systems and it might be the key to understanding the difference between systems that are abiotic and biotic that are alive versus not alive. So that said, um, I want to basically show you guys how information measures are related to epistemology, how they're related to the subjective experience so that you can then later go out and start maybe applying these measures to physical systems that you're already comfortable with and construct your own informational narrative of these systems to see if that informational narrative ends up telling you something a little bit more interesting about the physical systems. <coughs> All right, um, that, that's the goal, but to get there, we have to go through quite a bit. Um, so let me give you an outline of what my talks are going to be about. Um, we're gonna start off with language. Um, just basically how we talk about the world. And that'll be the first lecture. We'll develop how we can consistently describe the world in the simplest possible way. Uh, once we've constructed a language that we can use to describe things consistently, then we're going to look at belief. Credence, belief, uh, how strongly you believe in the things that are said in the language. And we will look at the Cox axioms for belief and basically develop the ways in which we can manipulate beliefs. We'll find something really, really interesting there. We'll find that uh, the rules that beliefs uh, follow for at least the simplest of languages that we'll develop are the same as the rules of probability theory which will then ground probability theory very firmly in an, on an epistemic foundation. Uh, we can basically use the, the Bayesian interpretation of probability as opposed to the frequentist interpretation of probability. Um, that will allow us to examine a much larger set of statements than a frequentist interpretation of probability allows us to do. Um, all right. 
Once we've developed belief and we see the dynamics of belief, how we can manipulate beliefs, how we gain belief, how our beliefs can get stronger or weaker, we'll get to a point where we kind of understand the dynamics of belief. And once we understand the dynamics of belief, then we can start to look at the process by which an epistemic agent, a thinking thing, uh, interacts with the world, gains information from the world, and through gaining, well, uh, the gains experience from the world, and through having experiences with the world, uh, information ends up being generated for the epistemic agent. So we'll go from language to belief to information. So I want to kind of like paint a picture of what this process means. We can think of it as there's this thing, which we call a world. What that is, I have no idea. None of us really have an idea. We have great pictures of the world, but what it means to be the world in and of itself is outside of uh, our capabilities. <clears throat> and, you know, we find ourselves in that world. We interact with it and we have sensory input. That sensory input is a type of data that comes into us and from it we can create pictures of the world that we're sitting in. Okay? But these pictures are not the same thing as a world. Right? These are epistemic states. These are paintings of the world that we have in our heads. And there's not just one possible painting. There are you know, many possible paintings. And based on the sensory data that we end up collecting, we can move around between these epistemic states that describe the world. In the first talk on language, what we're going to develop is how to talk about these epistemic states consistently. So out of all possible worlds that can exist, not all of them are consistent. Some of them are inconsistent. And if we want to talk about the world consistently, we have to make sure that we get rid of all of the inconsistent worlds. Once we've gotten rid of those and we have a consistent set of worlds, then we'll be able to talk about them using the language that we develop. <clears throat> the jump from language to belief will then be that you can't really believe in all of these worlds at once. Some of them you believe in more, some of them you believe in less. Some of them are more plausible, other ones are less plausible. So in the second lecture, we'll look at how to rank these worlds through a belief function that tells us pretty much which world we believe in the most and which ones we believe in less and less based on the sensory data that we've collected. Finally, information will happen through the dynamics. As we gain more and more data, that data informs us about whether or not we should stay stuck to a particular worldview, whether we should move and believe in a slightly different world than we believed in before once we've collected new data. So we'll really look at the dynamics of how we move through the, the realm of discourse. Uh, and the key to that will be a proper understanding of what information is. So, yes, we can start off with, with language. So, I hope everyone here has copied down the fact that we're having the launching conference uh, September 30th through October 1st. <coughs> if you forget, it's on the website. All right, so 
how do we talk about the world? In other words, how do we go from being an epistemic agent <coughs> that's stuck in the world to then creating these mental images of the world? We do that through the use of an idealized language. Language is what allows us to talk about the world and the things that we see in it. Now, the language is made up of things, and those atoms of the language are known as statements. Statements or sentences, they are the things that can be said about the world. Furthermore, for the language to be rich enough uh, to be able to do stuff with, we also have to have ways of combining statements into other types of statements. So this way of taking multiple statements, you could take one or two or three or four or 752 different statements and turn them into another single statement. These mappings are referred to as logical connectives. So we're going to try to construct um, a consistent language, a language that can describe as many worlds as possible, uh, in other words, as many combinations of statements as possible, uh, and construct logical connectives that make that language as expressive as possible. What we'll construct here is typically referred to as zeroth order logic. or uh, sentential logic. Um, it is the way in which we can manipulate sentences to create new sentences, meaning that the sentences themselves are constants. There are no variables in this language. There are more expressive languages that can be used, typically known as the higher order languages, first order, languages, second order languages, and so on and so forth. First order languages are a bit more expressive than zeroth order languages because they have variables in them. You can create sentences, uh, predicates that have uh, variables in them. So <coughs> first order languages are basically zeroth order languages plus quantifiers over the variables and predicates, which allow for variables in the sentences. Second order li languages are, are even more complicated than first order languages, because now we can not only quantify over the sentences in the language, but over the predicates in the language. So we can talk about uh, variable sentences about variables. To get to higher and higher order languages, you simply uh, can try to construct sentences that have in them variables uh, which are themselves sentences, which have variables in them, which in turn are also sentences that have variables in them, and get to much more expressive languages. We won't be considering these because the remainder of the, the talk uh, next time on belief has really only been shown to <coughs> work solidly in zeroth order languages. Whether or not we can extend uh, these belief functions, this interpretation of belief as probability to higher order language is an open question. So we'll stick to, to zeroth order stuff today. <coughs> All right, so we have this, this language with a whole bunch of statements in it. That's not enough though, okay? we need to have some sort of a value assignment on the statements in the world. And that value assignment can be thought of as the statement describes the world 
or the statement does not describe the world. So every single statement, <coughs> we can apply a value judgment to it and say, well, yeah, this statement is a description of the world, or this statement is not a description of the world. Typically, we'll simply refer to these as true and false. Turns out that when we go to belief functions, uh, you can sort of think of beliefs as being an extension of these binary value assignments of true and false to being a whole spectrum of value assignments where we will have statements that we don't believe in at all, we believe in a little, we believe in a little bit more, all the way up to we believe in completely. So <coughs> this, this form of value assignments will be a special case of the value assignments that we create when we start talking about belief. So what are these value assignments? I'm going to denote them with uh, letter tau. And they're mappings from the set of statements to um, the set true and false, meaning that you can take every single statement that's in the language and assign to it a value of being either true or false. <clears throat> As an example, let's say that we had a language with two statements. Ah, let's draw it as a box. It could be that the first statement is true and the second statement is true. Or it could be that the first statement is true, the second statement is false, false true, or false false. So there are multiple ways to assign the truth values to every single statement. Notice that here we have four possible ways of assigning truth values to these statements. In general, there's going to be um, two to the uh, s, uh, the, the size of the number of statements, number of assignments of truth values to the statements. Each of these assignments will be referred to as an epistemic state or a possible world. It's not necessarily the world that we live in, but it's one of the worlds that we can think about. So every single assignment is a possible world. And there's a lot of them. There's two to the s. So if we had like a hundred different statements in the language, there would be two to the hundredth power number of different epistemic states. So the number of epistemic states, the number of possible worlds that you can think of based on the language that you use is immense, right? There's a world where, you know, it's not raining outside and I'm a cat. And there's also a world where it's not raining outside and I'm not a cat etc., so on and so forth. These don't have to be real worlds, right? They're just worlds that have the particular truth assignment uh, on them that has been constructed. <coughs> so, how does consistency work in to all of this. So where is consistency? Because remember, in the end, we want to talk about all of the world's consistency. We want to use our language consistently um, to describe all possible epistemic states. And to do that, we really now have to look at this second aspect of a language, we've only been talking about statements up to this point, but we have to look at the logical connectives. And it's the logical connectives with the truth assignments that will determine whether or not a possible world in the epistemic realm is uh, kosher to talk about using the language. 
what this means is that we'll find that a bunch of the worlds are inconsistent worlds. And <clears throat> by looking at how logical connectives gel with the truth assignments, we'll be able to kill all the inconsistent worlds. And what we'll have left are the consistent worlds that we can talk about using the language. So our goal is going to be to find a language <clears throat> that can describe as many possible worlds as possible. <laughs> so that's going to be our, our goal right now, is to uh, figure out what this language is, what sort of logical connectives can be admitted into the language so that we can talk about as many epistemic states as we possibly can. So let's jump then to constructing these logical connectives. So first what we're going to look at is the general form of the logical connectives. Uh, and then we'll break it down to look at each type of logical connective and see which ones are possible. So <clears throat> uh, there are unary connectives. And those are the ones that basically take a single statement and map it to some other statement. So unary connectives uh, map from the set of statements to the set of statements. Binary connectives are ones that take two statements and then map them to a single statement. You can see that in general you can have what are known as n airy connectives. And those are the ones that take n different statements and map them to a single statement. So <clears throat> when, we disc when we find the logical connectives that are capable of describing the largest subset of the epistemic realm, uh, that set of logical connectives uh, will be called uh, functionally complete. if it can describe uh, as many statements as possible consistently. So first we'll attack uh, what possible unary connectives can exist. I'm sure that many of you have already seen a lot of this before. <clears throat> Hopefully the way that I'm structuring it will help to, to create a story that we can then use in the next lecture, which will be uh, I'd say a lot more calculus based than this one. But before we can even get to belief, we really need to understand how these languages work. So unary connectives. These are connectives that take a single statement, map it to another statement. So they take S and they map it to piece of S. <clears throat> now what does it mean for a logical connective to be consistent? Uh, it means that the dependence on the statement of the logical connective should only rely on the truth value of the statement itself. So <clears throat> Consistent logical connectives, a consistent unary logical connective, means that there exists some function psi so that if we take any statement and we map it to another statement, we could have taken the truth value of this statement and mapped it to the possible values. We could have also first used the binary, or sorry, the unary connective, and then 
looked at the truth value of the resulting statement. For phi to be consistent, there has to exist another function psi that makes this diagram commutative. In other words, we can either apply the unary connective to the statement and then take its truth value, or we can take the truth value of the statement and then apply the function psi to it, and the resulting answer will be the same for every single possible statement. That's what it means for this diagram to commute. So we can write this as the truth value of the logical connective applied to any statement s is equal to the function psi applied to the truth value of the statement s. So the question is then, how many of these different psi's exist? By determining how many of these different psi's exist, we can pinpoint how many different logical connectives will exist. And then we'll know what are all the uh, unary operators that we can use in our, uh, in our language. So how do we end up doing that? Oh, I should write for all s. This is true. So <coughs> psi maps the values true and false to the values true or false. So we need to know how true and false end up getting mapped by psi. <clears throat> well, true can either get mapped to true or false, and false can get mapped to either true or false, which means that there are two to the second possible different mappings psi. There is the mapping that sends both the statements to a true statement, both to a false statement, one for a false and a true statement, and the other one to a true and a false statement. Uh, it's kind of interesting because these guys form the vertices of a two-dimensional square. And for all higher order uh, uh, connectives, what we'll see is that <coughs> the number of them uh, is always going to be equal. So for n area connectives, there will always be 2 to the 2 to the n different uh, size. Uh, and they will form the vertices of a hypercube, so a cube in many, many dimensions. And we'll be able to use the symmetries of that cube to sort of see which logical connectives are really copies of other logical connectives. So we're going to go from all possible logical connectives on a single statement and see which ones of these will work. When we go to the case of two different logical connectives, uh, I'm sorry, binary logical connectives. There will be 2 to the 2 to the second, so 2 to the fourth, 16 different mappings. But we'll find out that a lot of those mappings are really saying the exact same thing. So what we want to do is we want to find the unique mapping or mappings uh, that the language allows. <coughs> so let's, let's look at all of these cases. So if we had a mapping that sent everything to true, that means that there has to be some true statement in the language. That means that the value judgment for that statement in every single epistemic realm, or I'm sorry, in every single epistemic state that this language describes, that statement needs to always be true. So this type of mapping can be admitted if there exists a tautology in the realm of discourse. So there has to be like one statement that is always true in every single possible world that you talk about. Uh, sure fundamentalists would have like no problem with admitting this type of a uh, this type of a mapping because there's always a statement to some people that's always true. Uh, same thing with this one, <coughs> except here we have to have a contradiction. So there has to be a statement that's always considered false. It's these two that are a little bit 
more interesting. So first let's look at this guy right here. This guy here says that psi acting on true is true and psi acting on false is false. Which means that whatever psi acts on, you get the exact same thing back. So <coughs> psi acting on the truth value of a statement s is equal to the truth value of that statement. Now we could use the definition of consistency here <coughs> so that psi composed with tau is uh, equal to tau composed with logical connective. Tau composed with phi of s. So we see then from here that the logical connective applied to s is s itself. So that basically means that this logical connective is the logical connective that does nothing. It just gets you back the exact same statement as before. So this is an uninteresting identity logical connective. It does nothing to your statements. The second logical connective is a little bit more interesting because the second logical connective <coughs> says that true statements get mapped to false statements and false statements get mapped to true statements. Well, if we apply psi twice to either of these, that means we'd get the exact same thing back. So in other words, psi composed with psi <coughs> of x is equal to x. So let's use, uh, so, so for any statement, we'll have that psi composed with psi composed with the truth value of that statement is equal to the truth value of that statement. Once again, we'll use the uh, consistency criterion uh, right here to flip these guys. We'll get psi composed with uh, tau of phi. And then we'll use it again here to get tau composed with phi composed with phi of s is equal to tau of s. So what this is saying is that the logical connective applied twice gets us back to the original statement. So this, this logical connective will be referred to as negation and it'll have a, a special symbol. Phi of s will be denoted as the negation of s. So this little symbol here means negation. In standard parlance of uh, a language, uh, it's, really under, it's really easy to understand this logical connective. I am not a cat, I am a cat. Right? Those two would be the application of the logical connective to uh, each of those statements. <coughs> so in the, uh, the language, right, we now know that there is one logical connective that takes us from a statement to what's known as the negation of that statement, and then it takes the negation of that statement back to the original statement. And this is the only interesting logical connective that is unary. All the other ones either rely on the existence of a tautology or a contradiction in the language, and the other one is an identity. So no need to, to really consider it. What am I doing on time? Okay, so now we know that there is one unary logical connective. Let's jump to the uh, next case, which is binary logical connectives. These are a bit more interesting to analyze. Binary logical connectives take two statements and map them to another statement. So we can write that <coughs> as phi of S1 and S2 is equal to some new statement S prime. You take two statements and you create another statement. The criterion of consistency here means that if we apply the truth value to both sides, uh, tau of s prime is equal to tau 
of phi of s1 and s2, there has to exist some function psi that is a function of solely the truth values of the arguments. So of tau of s1 and tau of s2. So our job now is going to be to figure out how many of these there actually are. We know that because you're mapping two arguments, two possible values to two values, there are two to the two to the second possible mapping. So there's 16 different mappings. But we already have a unary connection available to us, negation, um, oh, right there. So it uh, turns out that a lot of those 16 possible binary connectives are going to be redundant. They're going to be saying the exact same thing. You could use one of them together with negation to make another one. So there's no reason to include those in your set of binary uh, connectives. <clears throat> so um, let's actually find out which ones those are. Let's find what the unique binary connectives are. So this is going to require a little bit of, of diagram drawing. You know, Ursula, um, you know how in uh, tennis you have like that, that kid that runs around and picks up the ball? Why don't we have like someone that like runs and just cleans the board off like when we're done? Yeah, like a board wiper. That's true. If anyone has money, they could donate to the physics department at Dartmouth to get us a uh, LCD board. Um, okay, so <clears throat> we have to map all possible combinations of two truth values. So in other words, true, 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 false, false, true, and false, false to their respective values under psi. And each of these can be either true or false. So we can actually write out all of them with a neat little diagram that looks like this. That's eight, right? So we need 16 total. And I'm going to use white squares for uh, uh, true, and then black squares for false. Actually, you know what? There's colors here. I just use that. Um, so there is the mapping that sends all of these possibilities to all true. There's one that sends three of them to true, one of them to false. And there are four different types of those. Then there's all the ones that have two true values and true false, two tr false values. Uh, there, so there are six of them. And then there's finally the ones that have only a single truth value there. and the one that sends everything to a false statement. So, where? Oh, that is, that's not good. There we go. <clears throat> so there are 16 different possible values for psi. Once again, this guy here, and this guy here demand that there be a tautology and a contradiction. So we won't consider those. Secondly, um, some of these 
are actually unary operators in disguise. So some of these size take two truth values, T1 and T2, and just spit out either T1 or the truth value of the second statement. So uh, those are not new binary logical connectives because we can rewrite them by either using the identity. Um, which ones are those? Well, this guy right here and this guy right here are projections. <clears throat> Notice this one here only cares about the truth value of the first argument. So the first two are true, second are false. This one right here only cares about the truth value of the second argument. So true, false, true, false, which is why we have this right here. So these guys are out of the running. We don't have to care about them because they are just a un our unary negation in disguise. Next, we can consider psi of tau 1 and tau 2 being equal to psi prime of tau 1 and tau 2. If psi and psi prime, if two binary connectives end up satisfying this equation here, that means that one of them is just the negation of the other one. So they're really the exact same binary connective. What does that mean? Well, if we negate the truth values here, all we're doing is we're exchanging black squares or blue squares for white squares and white squares for, for blue squares. And it's also really funny that I keep referring to these as white squares because they're kind of black because we're on a blackboard. But there's a symmetry right there. Is that it? Yes. Between all the statements below and above. And for every single one of these guys, there's a corresponding one of these guys that satisfies this property. So let's not look at these anymore. These guys are just copies of one of these guys. All right, neat. That brings us down to not very many remaining possibly unique logical connectives. These four here and this guy right here. So five, possibilities and <clears throat> so let's use uh, negation now to see how the some of these guys are actually copies of one another first off if psi of tau 1 and tau 2 is equal to psi prime of the negation of tau 1 then these binary operators are going to be copies of one another. What does that mean for these pictures here? Well, remember that this was true, 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 false, false, true, false, false. So <clears throat> the first value is negated. So true, false becomes false, true. And true, false becomes false, false. So any diagrams that look the same when you do this to them are actually the same binary connective in disguise. So you'll notice, which ones are they? Well, this one, if we flip these two, we get two whites, and then we get a black white, which is that guy right there, are then uh, copies of one another. And these two guys here, if you flip those, you flip the two whites, they stay the same, or copies of each other. So these guys right here are not unique. OK. What else can we use? We can use the fact that if uh, If uh, the second argument is negated, then these guys are copies of one another. 
So what does that mean for our diagram here? Well, true true will be sent to true false. So these guys are going to get flipped. And false true is going to be sent to false false. Yes. So <coughs> any diagrams that look the same under that operation are in fact the same. You'll notice then that these two are the same and these two are the same. So out of these four possible binary connectives, there's only a single unique one. And from 16, we are now down to two possible binary connectives. Mm, okay. I just realized that I flipped my, my color scheme in what I was writing in the notes. But that's okay because if we negate these diagrams, then we'll have the diagrams I actually had in my notes and all will be well. Um, okay, uh, where did I put that last one? Okay, um, finally then, uh, the, what is, what about these two guys? Are they actually unique? Are they not unique? Can we do some sort of a transformation to them to show that they're actually the same thing? We can. It takes a, a lot more work to show that these two are equivalent to one another. But if we call this one here uh, psi prime and this guy psi, then psi prime tau 1 tau 2 is equal to psi of the negation of psi of the negation of tau 1, the negation of tau 2, comma, the negation of psi of tau 1, tau 2. So we have to actually embed the, uh, the functions in one another, the binary connectives. But if we embed them in this way, then it can be shown that these two give you the exact same truth table. So as an exercise, you can, you can do this. I'm running out of time, so I will not do that. <coughs> but it's a fun little exercise to, to draw this out. Um, so in the end, we only have a single logical connective, which I will now negate to draw like this. And this here is known as uh, conjunction. In standard parlance, it is the AND operation. <clears throat> so we typically write it using a wedge. So our binary uh, logical connective on S1 and S2 will be written as S1 and S2. That's how we write that down. And if we take the truth value of both of these, then tau of S1, tau of S2 evaluates with this diagram here. So both of these need to be true for and to be true if any or both of the remaining statements of, of the statements have a value of false, then this evaluates to false. So together, we have then that negation and and <coughs> are our unary and binary connectives that can use to string together statements into larger statements. Uh -huh. uh, you can also show that you can reduce the negation to... Yeah, the yes, if you have... The, okay, so we started off with unary operators because we wanted to start off with something simple. Okay, we could have started with binary operators from the get-go and then we would not have had all of these beautiful little uh, ways of connecting binary operators using the unary operator to create new statements, which means we would have had to do a lot more of this type of composition but if we did that, we could then show that this guy right here, 
uh, well, the negation of it, which is known as an XOR gate, or the NAND gate are functionally complete as well. In which case, we could have just used a single binary logical connective uh, to describe all the statements. Now, I don't want to do that because uh, these guys are easier to talk about colloquially. Right? We, can, we understand statements when we negate them or when we end them. It is raining outside and I am a cat. Right? That is obviously false because, or it is not raining outside and I am a cat. That is obviously false because I am not a cat. Right? You can understand that. If you wanted to use uh, XOR gates, then negating a statement would be a lot more complicated. Like, I don't want coffee would be something like, it is not the case that I want coffee, nor is it the case that I want coffee. Right? You don't say that to the barista, you say like, give me a coffee, or like, no, I don't want a coffee, I want a tea, okay? So it's much easier to use these connectives together. Now, obviously the next step would be to look at the trinary operators, the quaternary operators, all the higher level operators. And, I mean, there were 16 here, two to the two to the second. For ter ternary, trinary operators, there would be two to the eighth power different, uh, uh, logical connectives that we'd have to do this to. 256 different logical connectives. That's a whole lot of them. Fortunately, um, we don't need to. Uh, there's this neat little paper by uh, Jerzy Losch from uh, Wrocław uh, from 1950 that basically shows that all the higher order binary connectives uh, can be reduced to ands and negations. Technically, you have to use disjunction as well, which is known as or, but there's a connection between or and negation, and that is that uh, S1 or S2 is equal to the negation of the negation of S1 and the negation of S2. Um, that diagram looks like this here, where these guys are true and that guy is false. <coughs> so. Uh, you could use ands, ors, or just ands and negations, string them together in a particular way to make any higher arity logical connective that you want. So there's no need to actually go through all possible logical connectives because they all reduce down to ands and negation in zeroth order logic. Okay. So that's great. We have now logical connectives. Uh, what does that mean for our language? Well. What it means is that to talk about the world consistently, the truth values that we have on possible statements only need to be assigned to a subset of the statements known as atomic statements. So if this is our language, there is some subset here of statements that are known as atomic. And from these statements, we can construct all other composite statements. Now, these are called atomic because the truth values of these statements need to actually be assigned. But once they are assigned, that instantly forces the truth values of all the other statements in the epistemic realm. Okay? So, any truth assignment where the truth assignment of a guy out here uh, is not consistent with the truth assignments of the atomic statements is an, epis is, a, is an inconsistent epistemic state. Those are the states that we cannot talk about using this language. We get rid of them. We only then talk about the consistent epistemic states that that basically fall, where the truth values of all the composite statements follow from the truth assignments of the atomic statements. You can think of the atomic statements as sort of forming a basis for the space of all statements. The actual term for it would be a generator. The atomic statements end up generating the Boolean ring that describes the truth values of all the possible statements here. And just like bases are uh, there's a lot of freedom in choosing a basis, right? You can choose a coordinate system that's Cartesian, you can choose a spherical coordinate system 
so on and so forth. There's also a lot of freedom in what you choose as your atomic statements. Okay? Uh, just as a very, very, very quick example, let's say that we have two epistemic agents, Alice and Bob. <coughs> Alice chooses the statements A and C uh, with, uh, the, mm, as being atomic, and Bob chooses the statements B and C as being atomic. <coughs> that means to Alice, there is a statement B, which is composite, of the form um, B or C. Okay, so now I'm using disjunction, but remember that this disjunction is actually negation and, and conjunction being used together. Uh, ooh, and, or, sorry, uh, A and C, not A and not C. <coughs> so she can construct a statement B uh, out of her atomic statements. <coughs> Bob can construct a composite statement out of his atomic statements of the form B and C or not B and not C. As it turns out, for any statement that Alice makes of the form uh, that uses A and C in them, <coughs> there will be another statement uh, by Bob uh, where now A is a function of both B and C, and actually just B and C, uh, C and possibly other things, that is um, equivalent to a statement that Bob can make. So <clears throat> this freedom in choosing uh, the, the basis, the, the generators for your, uh, for your language is there. Uh, different people can choose different statements to be the fundamental things that they talk about. Like, this is the fundamental statement from which I derive other things. Other people can choose other fundamental statements from which to derive other things. But <coughs> the logical connectives that we've developed here make it so that it doesn't matter which statements you end up choosing. Well, kind of matters which statements you choose as atomic. Uh, but there's a lot of freedom there. So different people can have different uh, ways of assigning those atomic statements. Um, okay. You all possible truth values on the atomic statements. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. But remember that the epistemic, uh, the, the realm of discourse is all possible assignments of truth values. So really, we're still talking about all possible worlds. We're just now talking about them consistently. Our language is capable of describing every single possible world consistently. There are no inconsistent worlds that you can get to. Uh, the logical connectives gel together with the truth assignments of the atomic statements that have been chosen. So we're, we're at the end here. Basically, we've, we've developed a very, very, very simple model of language that we can now talk about statements uh, consistently, there are values on them. Recall that, you know, we were stuck in a world and we imagined ourselves being stuck in a world and there were a whole bunch of these. We now know what this bubble is of all possible consistent worlds. Well, what we'll do next time is we're going to jump to belief. So belief is a way of ranking these worlds Okay? so that you believe in some of them more and some of them less. And we will use uh, some, we'll look at some basic ways of describing belief to come up with very plausible axioms for how beliefs should work, and we'll develop the implications of those axioms next time um, and see that there is a beautiful connection between how we believe in these different possible worlds to probabilities. So thank you very much. If there's any questions, yes. So um, in this example that you have at the very beginning, you talk about languages and thoughts and kind of how you can imagine another world as, a, as an agent. Um, but can you have thoughts without language? So the language is an idealized language, right? It could be like your pictures of the world that you have that you consider to be descriptive of the world or not descriptive of the world. 
Also, I keep mentioning epistemic agents here, and you have to realize that when I say epistemic agents, I'm not really talking about us as thinking things, but I'm really thinking about these idealized thinking things that have uh, at their disposal this language, this ideal language to talk about the world, and uh, they're automatically consistent. Right? Once they know the truth value of any two statements, or three statements, or 12 statements, and then combine those using uh, uh, logical connectives, they instantaneously know what the truth value is of that statement. I could tell you a really complicated poetic statement that you'd have to think about for a moment to be like, wait, that's true, you're not really saying anything. That's like a tautology. Right? To these epistemic agents, these idealized thinking things, uh, all the truth values are like instantaneously present to them. So in a sense, you can sort of think of epistemic agents as being sort of this, this limiting process to actual thinking things like us. We are not exactly epistemic agents. Uh, the rules that we'll develop are for these epistemic agents that are almost like believing thinking machines because of the fact that they can update their beliefs and and have uh, before them all possible statements instantaneously at all times. Uh, yeah, it, these are the idealized thinking things that, that we'll be talking about. So hopefully that like skirts around <laughs> your question of needing <laughs> a world to, to get a language. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. I really appreciate the ambition of this. Uh, I, I have two questions. So one is, uh, the last point that you made about uh, different sets of atomic statements being interdefinable, I wonder how you can be confident about that if you don't know the semantics of the atomic statements. I mean, how, how would you know that A equals B and C or not B and not C uh, for Bob if Bob doesn't have access to the same semantics that Alice does? in regard to A. The second question is about the, um, the, the restriction to, to zeroth order logic. I wonder, it's a more general question, whether you've thought about what kinds of limitations that puts on your general model. It, whether if we were to try to do this for first order logic and couldn't, that that would tell us something about the limitations of this you know, program. Mm. All right, so for, I, I can't really answer the second question. I don't really know too well uh, how far any of this has been extended to higher order logic. It's pretty difficult to extend these ideas to like an infinite number of atomic statements, although that has been done. Uh, other ways of extending it, not so sure. And as for these statements, uh, take these definitions as being like axiomatic. Like this is just how Alice constructs the statement B. And if she constructs it this way, then Bob will be able to reconstruct her uh, atomic statement in this way. So one of these is like chosen from the get-go. If one of them is chosen from the get-go, then Bob knows how to construct the exact same statement using his atomic statements. Does that help a little bit? Yes. Okay. So you're saying they're interdefinable, uh, and it doesn't. It's arbitrary. It doesn't matter. A. Yeah. It's the, these A and C are not like completely independent from the. Well, I mean, the C is the same. The A and the B are not independent from one another. We're just saying that Alice has decided to construct a statement that looks like this. Then if a happens to be an atomic statement for, I'm sorry, if uh, B happens to be an atomic statement for Bob, then he can then reconstruct her A with this formula here. See, the, the content of that definition there doesn't matter. Right, consistency only cares about the truth values of the statements, right? Psi doesn't care about the underlying meaning of the statements. It only cares about the truth value of the statements. So I'm not applying any sort of interpretation to the statements. Right? I'm just taking them for granted as existing and 
then talking about possible epistemic states as being every single possible you know, assignment of a truth value. On those statements. Can we give an example of this? Oh, Lord. Um, you know, if there is no context, how the heck? Because you know, let's say C is it's raining outside, and A is I'm a woman, and B is. Oh, no, no, but you can't. So like there, B will depend on A and C. It's just that like, yeah, yeah, B depends on A and C. Once you've chosen A and C, B has to be this. It's just that, that, that Alan, or I'm sorry, Bob, right? Bob is not, uh, Bob just doesn't believe that A is atomic. Bob believes that A can actually be constructed out of other sentences, right? Alice believes that like, you know, a particular statement is is atomic that it can't be constructed out of anything else right Bob has a way of constructing Alice's atomic statement out of his atomic okay. statement Ooh. okay so but then that the definition will depend on uh, semantics for the atomic statements it won't it won't okay. like it's <laughs> no, yeah, it's, it's the same generators it's totally like, formal and totally formal it's just yeah. like any kind of propositional logic, P and Q, you can drive all kinds of theorems about it, and it doesn't matter what P and Q are. They could be the same, in fact. Right, so like take the entire set of atomic statements, you know, C1, C2, dot, 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 CN that Alice has, and think of any statement that she can construct out of these guys. There is an equivalent statement that Bob can construct out of his set of atomic statements that interchanges one of the generators. But the, the, the Boolean ring is generated by both this set and by this set. Okay, so you can reach all possible combinations of truth values using either ones of these as generators. And by generators, I mean like taking all of these statements together and then combining them in any possible arbitrary way with the binary and unary operations of, of conjunction and negation. Okay. Okay. Maybe one less. Okay, so um, with this generators idea, I mean, it's very close to what you have for groups. Is there any notion of these? These are a ring. Okay. Yeah. I mean, close. Yeah, yeah. Um, is there a notion of the minimal set? Uh, yes, and that's what the atomic. That's what you know, with bounds on it. Rather. I mean, like there's a theorems to like if I have a language of this size. That it must be generated finitely, or you know, it can be only this size. That's a very interesting question, and I don't know the answer to that. But that—that's interesting. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Great. I think we should close. Today. Thank you. Alrighty. Thank you all so much.